What's up friends, I got a brand new video for you today. Welcome to 2023. I'm starting the year off with my review of the Canon R6 Mark II, which was actually released a couple months ago, so it's not that old, but I just got it now. And the last Canon camera review was the R5 back in 2020, so it's been a while. And I'm not gonna lie, I was pretty excited to start shooting with Canon again and see the improvements made since the last time I shot with a Canon camera. Also, huge thanks to Canon Canada for loaning me out the R6 Mark II for a couple weeks. Unfortunately, it was during the Christmas holidays and then we got a massive snowstorm. It was the craziest weather we've had in a long time, but I was still able to get out there, freeze my hands off and get some awesome images as well as shoot in the studio as well. So strap in, there's a lot to unpack. So first things first, this camera is probably one of the best full frame mirrorless hybrids you're gonna find in this price range. And it kind of shares that sweet spot with the Sony a7 IV, which is mainly what I shoot with. And this camera is gonna be good for all kinds of things, pro photography, casual photography, filmmaking, basically anything. It kind of just hits all those sweet spots. And there will be a video coming where I compare this to the Sony a7 IV. I tried to shoot them side by side as much as I could, so stay tuned for that video. When it comes to specs, this camera's loaded. It has a brand new 24 megapixel full frame sensor, and that's up from the 20 megapixel sensor found in the original R6. And a lot of people were speculating that they were gonna use the same sensor that was found in the R3, but this is a new sensor in this camera designed specifically for the R6 Mark II, and it's fast. This camera can shoot up to 12 frames per second mechanical shutter and up to a crazy 40 frames per second in electronic shutter. It has dual UHS-2 card slots, and it's got updated in-body stabilization with up to seven stops and eight stops if you have a lens that has IA. Yes. And you can also shoot 4K video up to 60 frames per second, 10-bit 422, as well as 180 frames per second in 1080p. And you can do all that also while shooting in a Super 35 crop mode if you'd like as well. And they've supposedly somewhat sorted out the overheating issues on this camera, so it can record for much longer now than the original R6 without overheating. And that camera also had a record limit where this doesn't. Now the body design hasn't really changed massively from the original R6, but there are a few changes. And there are a few changes that I kind of scratch my head at because they're kind of weird. But the grip feels amazing. The button placement's awesome, just like you'd expect on any Canon camera. And it has the aperture dial as well as the joystick on the back. The EVF is pretty solid at 3.69 million dots and a refresh rate of 120 frames per second. It's rocking a three inch 1.6 million dot articulating touchscreen, which is very responsive and it's nice and bright. When it comes to I.O., it has dual UHS-2 card slots, 3.5 millimeter mic and headphone jacks, USB-C for power and micro HDMI. And then on the top of the camera, we've got the mode dial that lets you program three customizable settings, ISO dial to the right of that with the on and off switch underneath, a video record button above that, and then a programmable function button beside the shutter speed dial. And then over on the left side, we've got the toggle between photo and video. Now this is where I'm kind of scratching my head because previously Canon had the power switch on that side of the camera. And although I'd rather have the power switch near the shutter button, like on most cameras, they've decided to swap them and kind of cram the power on and off switch over where the shutter button is. And it kind of feels weird. And there's a few times where I actually were switching between photo and video, thinking I was gonna turn the camera on and off. So that's something you're just gonna to have to get used to. So when I first got the camera, like I always do, I dive into the menus to see what we've got in this camera. And the menus in this camera are so simple and easy to use. I actually don't think there's a better menu system out there. And it really hasn't changed much since the old Canon DSLRs. Obviously they've added new features and whatnot, but it's very similar to how it's laid out. And although it lacks all the crazy fine customization of like a Sony camera, I think there's something nice about just leaving it simple with less options, especially if you aren't crazy technical and you just wanna pick the camera up, dial in your settings and shoot. While browsing the menus, I got a chance to really see all the new autofocus options on this camera because this is a huge update for this camera. It's really good it's using a similar autofocus system to the R3, which is probably one of the best autofocus systems out there. The R6 Mark II has a bunch of intelligent AI subject tracking modes like human, animal, vehicles. But what's cool is that you can actually leave it in auto and it'll just figure out what the subject is and morph to that. Now, Sony has all these same AI subject tracking modes in the new A7R5. I mostly just stuck to human eye autofocus because that's what I was shooting. And the eye autofocus is really sticky. It's really accurate. And it's way better than what I could remember when I was shooting with the R5 back in 2020. This AF system is really, really good. And if you're a portrait photographer, you're gonna love it. 
Of course, you have all the control over all the tracking speed and sensitivity, and I'm pretty sure I just left it in the out of the box settings. And I was pretty happy with the performance, just leaving it like that. I did do some video eye autofocus tests and it did a really great job of picking my face out even when I had sunglasses on. And I did a test side by side with the a7 IV, so you're just gonna have to wait for that video. But spoiler is that the R6 Mark II actually picked my face out from further away than the a7 IV did. Now I won't say that it's better than a7 IV at video autofocus performance when it comes to lower light situations. That's where I noticed it started to hunt around a little bit more and became less predictable compared to the a7 IV. Um, it's not like it's horrible, but it's just something I thought I'd mention because it was something I saw in the test. When it comes to low light performance, I was pretty impressed with how far you can actually push the sensor. It does a pretty nice job all the way up to 6400 ISO and I wouldn't even have a problem shooting at 12,800 if I had to. Once you pass that, it starts to get pretty noisy and the image starts to soften up. But as far as full frame sensors go today, it's pretty solid. And I didn't even bother shooting past 25,600 ISO because if you need to shoot that high, you've got more of a light problem and not so much a camera problem. So as I mentioned earlier, it can shoot full frame over sampled 4K up to 60 frames per second, 10-bit 422, and it looks awesome. It can also shoot 6K ProRes RAW through the HDMI, but I wasn't able to test that. All that said, it is limited to IPB instead of all I, and in order to shoot 10-bit, you gotta shoot in C-Log3. And I'm sure many of you know that C-Log3 isn't as good as C-Log2 when it comes to dynamic range. And Canon has kind of left that off their mirrorless cameras and saved it for their cinema cameras. I get why they're doing that, but it's kind of annoying knowing that you could probably have that easily in this camera. So when shooting slow motion, you can shoot 120 frames per second, or you can shoot all the way up to 180 frames per second. That's IPB and it is 10 bit, it's 1080p. But I did notice that it took a hit when it came to dynamic range and the image is quite a bit softer with a lot more noise in the shadows when you're shooting C-Log3. If you're not shooting C-Log, it looks a lot cleaner, but you can see here the noise in the shadows and I was only at 800 ISO in daylight. I just quickly want to jump in here and tell you about today's sponsor and that's Cinematch. If you don't know what Cinematch is, it's an awesome camera color matching plugin from the people over at Film Convert. And if you've ever had to edit a project that had like two or three different cameras, I'm sure you know how difficult it is to try and grade them and make them match and look the same. Cinematch works seamlessly with Premiere Pro, Final Cut, as well as DaVinci Resolve, and that gives you raw-like camera controls that are tailored to the camera sensor that you're shooting with. They have all the major camera brands and they continuously add cameras as there's new updates. So let me show you how it works. I have some footage from three different cameras here, shooting S-Log3, C-Log3, as well as V-Log. All you have to do is set the input camera log profile that you shot with, and then choose the output log profile that you want to convert it to. So in this case, the other two cameras are gonna match my Sony S-Log3, so I chose that. And then once you've chosen that, you can click on Rec. 709 Transform, and it converts it on the fly. Now, depending on the white balance you had set on that camera, they might not always be the same. Cinematch gives you a bunch of tools to dial that in since you know, not every camera will always have the exact same white balance. From here, you also have other tools like color wheels, RGB curves, as well as HSL curves. This plugin is not only great for matching cameras, but also if you just wanted to transform your log footage into a completely different look, like an Arri Alexa Mini, for example, you can do that. This plugin is super cool, and I think you guys might be interested in it, so make sure to check the link in the description, and you can also try it out for free. So as I usually do, I try to cover some of the things I dislike about the gear so you know what you're getting into. And there are a few on this list, but they're not technically deal breakers. But uh, one of them being that you can only shoot C-Log3 if you want to get 10-bit 422. And if you're just shooting in a standard picture profile, it's going to be H.264 8-bit. But that C-Log3 is H.265 10-bit. Now, if you've got an older computer, H.265 is going to run horrible on your system and you're going to need to make proxies. Um, if you have a newer Mac like the M1s, they love H.265, so you won't really have a problem with that. Um, you also don't have many options for bit rates or different codecs. You just kind of shoot an IPB regular or IPB low. So you've got kind of a lower and a higher bit rate. Next thing would also pertain to video and that's the overheating. Although this camera is much better, I was able to get it to overheat after about 50 minutes of 4K 60p, but I wasn't able to get it overheat at 4K 24 frames per second. It almost ran for about two hours till the card was done. So keep that in mind if you want to shoot 
4K 60p for long periods of time, you're gonna have some issues with overheating. And I will note that I only tried that in full frame 4K 60p. I never tried it in the crop mode. So I'm not sure if you would have less heating issues or not with the crop mode. And I'll bring this up again, the on and off switch is kind of in a weird place. I feel like it needs to be swapped with the photo video toggle. I don't know why they did this. They decided to do this, but I guess if you're shooting with this camera often, you would get used to that and it wouldn't be an issue. And the last thing is the micro HDMI port. I don't know why Canon's still doing it. These ports are the worst. They're so fragile. If you're using HDMI often, you know what kind of an issue you're gonna have with these things. I'm glad that most of the industry has moved to full size HDMI, but unfortunately not on this camera. So if you are planning to shoot 6K raw over HDMI, you need to be super careful. So my final thoughts on this camera, I was really surprised how awesome this camera is. I wasn't expecting to like it this much. Uh, the bump in resolution up to 24 megapixels was needed over the original 20 megapixels in the R6. The image quality is exceptional, especially when you're using these awesome RF lenses. Um, I'm not gonna really speculate on color science because I don't really think it matters that much anymore. Everyone's doing a great job. People will say that Canon color is amazing, but if you're shooting raw, or shooting in log, you can pretty much make this camera or any cameras kind of look the same. Um, it just kind of comes down to personal preference, I guess. The autofocus is amazing and I'd say it's really similar to Sony now. Having shot with Sony as my main camera system for the last five years, it's really comparable. And I'm saying that after my mind was blown with the Sony a7R5 and all the AI stuff it has. Um, I will have a comparison video to the a7 IV coming soon, so make sure to get subscribed so you don't miss that one. But I will say that when I was using the RF 50 millimeter f1.2, the autofocus seemed to hunt a little more until I put this lens on the 24 to 70 and it was way better. So I don't know if it's my loner copy that I was sent, but I did notice that. No time limits now while shooting video. It's got insanely fast burst rates up to 40 frames per second in electronic shutter. Great build quality, awesome weather ceiling. It's got a really nice touch screen. Uh, the menus are awesome. This is kind of a do it all camera, portraits, landscape, sports, wildlife. I really love cameras that kind of fall into this category because it gives you everything you need all for kind of a decent price. This camera is $2,500 US, and if you're thinking about picking one up, I'll have it linked in the description. Thanks again to Canon Canada for hooking me up with this review unit. I think it's time to end the video here. I just talked way too much. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you dislike this video, give it a thumbs down twice. Don't forget to hit that notification bell, and I'll see you guys in the next one.